Welcome to episode 19 of Toxic Mold Sucks Stories. April is Autism Awareness Month. We thought it would be fitting to see how the two concepts of autism and mold can go hand in hand and have go hand in hand. For a few years now, people have been looking into this. Today, we are joined by Emily Rochelle. She is, first of all, a mother, a wife. She's one of my best friends. She's also the co-founder and board director of Malachi's Message, and her family has seen the connection between mold and autism firsthand. So Emily, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Elizabeth, for, for having me on. So before we kind of start, we need to set the baseline, I think, that your family went through toxic mold at the time you had a young son. Yes. And was he, before y'all moved into your moldy environment, was he meeting all of his deve developmental markers? Was he in good health? Was he aware? What was he like before you guys moved into your moldy environment? He was the best baby. He was meeting all of his developmental milestone. He was such a joy. He was laughing all the time, constantly, you know, wanting his parents' attention, um, looking at us in the eye. Didn't have any problems with being held by other family members, even our neighbors. You know, our, one of our neighbors who was such a good friend of ours, she loved to do photography and she'd come get home from our house and go take him over to her home and do, you know, baby photo shoots. And he had a blast. He had no problems being around other people. He loved, you know, getting into things and trying to figure things out. You know, like he knew that plugs plugged into the outlet and he paid attention. He tried to do that, obviously. <laughs> We would tell him no, um, you know, but anything that we did, he was, you know, intrigued by and interested in. He was just such a, such a great little baby. Um, and then, of course, we moved into this environment that just um, started to affect him. And um, thank God it affected me, too, because otherwise, I don't know what would have happened moving forward if I had not experienced pretty much the same thing that he was experiencing. Yeah, it, it might have been more of a write-off, right? Like, this yeah. is just what the doctors are saying about him because nobody else is sick, so this must be what's happening. So what did you start to see, though? I know we've talked about it off camera, but what did you start to see happen to Sebastian from moving into the townhouse to a few months later? What did, yeah, what difference did you, did you start to see in him? Um, I'm going to preface this with, um, the environment that we moved into, it was a blessing that it was so toxic because a lot of people, when they start to have mold symptoms, it's usually one person in the home. So it's harder to figure out, but because this townhome was literally like littered with tons of toxic molds for years before we ever moved in, it, everybody had a reaction that first week when we moved into this home. So it was easier for us to kind of be like something Something doesn't seem right, even though in the beginning we pawned it off to we just moved, it's stress, let's give this time. We're in a new area. Some of the doctors are saying pollen's higher in this area. So that's probably why you're having all these sinus issues and you know, itchy throat and you know, moving stressful that can cause um, GI issues and headaches and so forth. But when we first moved in, the first thing that I, I noticed with Sebastian was he started to, he got sick for the first time. He had a horrible sinus infection, uh, just tons of drainage, had a horrible time breathing. And um, then I just started to notice that he, his reaction times started to be more delayed. Like if I said his name, he wouldn't really respond immediately. I'd have to say it again. Um, he was slower to crawl. He was slower to move around. And then all of a sudden he went up on his tiptoes and he never came down off his tiptoes. He literally was on his tiptoes 97% of the time out of the day. Um, he stopped being interested in anything. He used to love to turn on all the lights. Now he didn't even wanna look at it. He didn't want any of the lights on. Lights actually made him upset. He became very sensitive to lights. He became very sensitive to noise. Um, before we moved into this townhome, he had no problem if I wanted to go blend one of my protein drinks or one of my vegetable shakes. He had no problem with the vacuum cleaner. He actually loved the vacuum cleaner. He thought it was funny. Um, but now you couldn't make a noise that would be considered kind of loud without setting him off into just this spiral of this tantrum where he would just scream. And it wasn't a scream that he's upset it was like he was in pain it's a different kind of scream 
um, those were the things that I started to notice um, within the first seven months of, of this town hall. And obviously he, he, then, he then also went on to lose all of his words. Um, on one doctor's visit, the doctor, we went in to get um, one of his vaccines that he needed for his schedule, but the doctor, when he walked into the office room was kind of like, um, is he always like this? And um, I was like, well, he doesn't like other people now. And he, he gets very anxious and he screams if somebody tries to get around him. And so he actually felt so bad for Sebastian because Sebastian kept trying to fight him that he was just like, we're not doing the vaccine today, which, which I think was a good idea. Um, now looking back, so um, it was, he just became a different child. He just a completely different child. He wasn't smiling anymore. Um, over the 13 months that we were there, he lost all of his expressions. So like his sister, Jocelyn, she actually turns a year old tomorrow. And it's been very interesting to watch her develop because she's literally followed Sebastian's development up until the town home. She's very inquisitive. She's very happy and smiley and she's into everything. She's already walking. Um, she's already saying mama and dad, dad, like Sebastian did. And, um, but Sebastian, like Jocelyn, you can tell what she's thinking when you look at her. You can tell when she's thinking about things. You can tell when she's, you know, she's doing something she knows she's not so supposed to be doing. She'll look to see if we're looking. Sebastian <laughs> stopped doing all of that. You couldn't tell what Sebastian was thinking. It was just a, like a blank stare all the time. And he wouldn't look at us in the eyes and he stopped answering to his name. He just became a different how, how old was he when you guys moved into the townhome? 10 months. 10 months. Mm -hmm. So you saw this all happening, right? And you guys are in the process. You're also getting sick at this time. How did you pursue this? Did you start to see doctors to see if there was something going on with Sebastian? Did you still just chalk it up to the town home and everything that was going on there? How did you, what was your mental process from this point? Well, we have um, some people in our family that are in the medical industry and some of them and we have friends that are in the medical industry and they were saying, well, maybe it's just his, he's teething. Maybe he's teething and that's why he's so upset. You know, maybe that's why he doesn't want to be touched anymore. He's just in so much pain, give him some Tylenol, you know, and, um, you know, that's just his age. He's just, maybe it's growing pains. Um, and it didn't happen all at once. It was, gradual over the 13 months, which makes it even harder to put together, especially when I also started to get very, I wouldn't say I was sick, not as in I looked sick, but neurologically, I started to have tons of issues. I started to not to be able to read anything anymore. I couldn't retain any information. I had short-term memory problems that were so severe. Um, I couldn't follow a conversation anymore. I had terrible headaches that my brain was so inflamed it hurt to even touch my head. So I almost became to, I, I would say, to a point to where it was hard for me to start to continue to connecting the dots because I was so messed up too. The mold was inflaming my brain to a point to where I couldn't function, I couldn't think. Um, and this was like towards the end of our stay in this town home when I really went downhill. I was still functioning up until I would say a 10, 10, 11, about nine months in, about nine months in, I was really dealing with more hormone related disruption issues, um, anxiety development. I, I developed anxiety out of nowhere. Um, now looking back, I can see what was going on with Sebastian. He was he was having anxiety attacks where you just can't you can't console that type of an anxiety attack, and that's why he would scream for hours and you couldn't console him. I had you know GI issues. Um, I was losing my hair. I had sinus problems. But whenever I started to stay in the environment more, starting de the December before April when we moved out, that's when I started to have tons of neurological problems. Um, because I wasn't leaving the environment anymore, like I, I was beforehand. So, but Sebastian just kept going downhill. And one of the things though, and why he was more affected is because where do, where do mold spores and mycotoxins settle? They settle on the ground. And where was my son crawling? 
he was crawling on the ground. He was more exposed. And it, it's true. Is it true? I know you showed me a picture earlier, but the wall that had the most stacky in it was actually right near his play area, correct? That had the highest score count was right near where he was playing in his playpen. Yes. So his playpen was literally about a few feet away from the wall that had all the stucky as well as all the shetomium and the aspergillus and penicillin molds. And um, the air sample that was taken that showed also present for stucky in the air sample um, and shetomium and so forth was taken from his playpen where he spent most of his day. So how do you go from this? How do you go from seeing those symptoms, you know, you're being affected to, how did you go from that to getting the diagnosis of autism? Well, when we got out of the town home, people had already been mentioning to me um, about Sebastian could be, that he could be autistic. I, um, I was having a hard time even looking up what that was. I didn't want to think about that because I knew that I was sick from mold. I knew that I had all these issues from mold and I knew that's what was happening to my son. And I didn't wanna look at any sort of diagnosis, but when I put him into a mommy's, uh, kind of like mommy's day out daycare center um, where he would go two days a week, his preschool teacher is the one that alerted me and said, look, there's some red flag with Sebastian. Um, she was so sweet, I love her. And she was just like, he needs some more help. And so she introduced me to early childhood intervention, ECI, where they came in and they evaluated him at home to see what services that they could provide him. And so once they did that, they started to have some people come to our home um, once a week to work with Sebastian. And then they, they determined that he needs to be formally evaluated for autism. And so, at on April 28, 2017, so almost five years from the date is when we went in and he was formally evaluated. And I even have the evaluation papers I can show you. And they decided that, yeah, Sebastian was autistic and more on the severe side. And, um, you know, I, that's when I, I, I was forced to look at what, what is autism? What does this mean? I thought it was something that, and I, and I know that, you know, some kids are born autistic, but some kids regress into autism. And that's what happened with my son. Um, luckily for me, I knew what the culprit was, which was mold and mycotoxins. And so I, uh, I didn't want to accept that diagnosis. However, that diagnosis was a blessing because it did open more doors for more um, therapies that Sebastian could get to help him. Um, which, you know, he did receive, but during those, obviously during that time, I just continued to detox Sebastian of the mold and myco mycotoxins, because I knew if I could get all of that out of the system, then his body could heal, his brain could heal, and then hopefully he wouldn't have these lifelong challenges anymore. So we're going to take a quick break here, but we want to come back and we want to hear, it's, it's pretty amazing how Emily pursued healing for Sebastian and how things lined up so she could get some answers and where he's at today. It's amazing. We saw him a few weeks ago and he is not the kid you've described with blank stares and no smiles at all. But we're going to take a quick second to thank one of our event sponsors, um, Dr. Osborne. Mr. Peter Osborne is a doctor of chiropractic, doctor of pastoral science, an expert in functional nutrition, and is board certified with the American Clinical Board of Nutrition. Oftentimes, he's referred to as the gluten-free warrior. He is one of the most sought-after alternative and nutritional experts in the world. He is the founder of the Gluten-Free Society, the author of Gluten-Free Health Solution, and has a series of digital videos and ebooks designed to help educate the world about gluten. In addition, he is the author of the international best-selling book, No Grain, No Pain, which was also printed in five languages and turned into a PBS special that aired nationwide. He's currently one of our event sponsors for our Pie in the Face fundraiser. If you'd like to know more about the Gluten Society or Dr. Peter Osborne, please make sure to go check them out. <music> So you've gone through the process, Sebastian, 
Um, you've realized that Mold is the culprit. He has the diagnosis of autism and it was kind of wave after wave for you guys. You got your official, like, this is Mold. A few months later, right, Sebastian gets diagnosed with autism and there were some pretty key people that kind of showed up out of literally nowhere that helped you figure out this, this is not permanent. This is not something that he needs to be diagnosed with for his lifetime. Who were some of those people and what process happened from there to get him from the diagnosis to the boy he is today? He was formally diagnosed a little over a year after we left the town. Okay. Um, along this journey, um, we, he got diagnosed four months after we lost our son Malachi and, um, God really showed up and put some key people in our pathway in order to basically give me hope and tell me that continue moving forward, continue doing what you're doing. Just put your head down. Sebastian's going to get better. You know, don't listen to anything else that, cause some people were telling me Sebastian was never going to get better and to accept this. And I was not going to do that. And so God did put some people in, in my path that um, said, no, you can get your son better. One of them was I was at a park one day with Sebastian and this lady sat down next to me and these two kiddos that she brought to the park went over to Sebastian. He had this little car and they were trying to play with the car with Sebastian. Obviously, Sebastian didn't play with other kids at this time. He obviously wasn't speaking either. And these kids were his age, they were speaking. And so something in me told me just to say something to this lady that, look, my son is nonverbal. Um, he's not gonna play with your kids. I hope, you know, he's, he's gone through mold and he's, he's in recovery right now. And as soon as I said this, and she was the first stranger I had really, just decided to tell that we were going through mold and recovery. And she just looked at me and she said, well, what do you mean? And so I told her our story and uh, we just lost, we just lost Malachi probably six weeks prior. And, um, and so she just sat there and listened. And then I picked up Sebastian. I went to the other side of the park because I wanted the kids to play with his toy because they really wanted to. And he wasn't playing with it anymore. So but he gets upset if somebody tries to play with his toy. So I picked him up, took him to the other side so he wouldn't see that they were playing with his car. And um, all of a sudden the lady walked over to me with her cell phone and she said, I want you to talk to my friend. She's a doctor. And I was like, okay. You know, so um, this lady, I think she's in New York and I'm in Texas and her name's Dr. Ray Bannigan. And she just said, listen, my friend just told me what you said to her. And I want to tell you right now, I have worked with so many kiddos who have gone through mold and get misdiagnosed or diagnosed as autistic. Your son is probably going to be diagnosed as autistic. I just want to tell you this, but he can get better. And so she actually sent me some paperwork to fill out to see where he was. And I mean, she was such a blessing. And she, she also then told me, she, she said, um, uh, let me guess, is he on his tiptoes? I was like, yes, yes. And she said, have you had his inner ear tested? And I was like, no, I've actually gone to his pediatrician several times now trying to see if he has an ear infection or something because I see all this drainage and he says no. And she said, you have to go back to your pediatrician, demand you go to an ENT, have his inner ear tested. I guarantee you it's blocked, it's full. That's why he's up on his tiptoes. And that's why he's not being able to hear your words to, you know, which would help him progress, learn language. And so I said, okay. So I did what she told me to do. We went to the ENT and sure enough, he failed his hearing test. I was like, oh my God, okay. Um, so I was like, inner ear fluid. So I looked into that and sure enough, there's information out there that talks about the inner ear, um, how you're not only how that's going to keep you from progressing to learn language and stuff, but, um, but it will cause you to go up on your tiptoes. And so we had him scheduled to get tubes put in and the tubes were scheduled for just right after this formal evaluation of autism. And so um, after we got the autistic uh, autism diagnosis, he had his surgery. A week and a half after his surgery, he never went back up on his tiptoes. And before the surgery, 
um, the people, some of the people that had been in Sebastian's life evaluated and evaluating him told me that that's a form of stimming is him up on his tiptoes. Well, it can also be because his inner ear fluid is, his inner ear is full of fluid. And, um, and that was the case in Sebastian's. So when we got his tubes put in, we also found out that his adenoid was swollen, which was blocking the drainage from even draining. Um, so they took that out. They also noticed that his, um, what do you call it, tonsils were swollen and told us that he might have sleep apnea to look at that. And obviously that was determined too. We had to take him back to the hospital where he had to stay overnight, put all these things on his head. And he did have sleep apnea because um, his airway was very small due to, due to the swollen tonsils. So we had to have those out. Um, it was a process, but those were some key things that helped progress Sebastian. And then um, I also met an amazing woman named Haley Eddington and her son um, actually uh, was diagnosed with autism and they moved into a home that had mold and he started to regress. Haley is like the, one of the smartest people I've ever met on this planet. This woman is just amazing and she's a doctor too. And um, when I met her, she told me about macrophages and how, you know, a lot of kiddos with autism, and I also looked at people with mold, their macrophage levels are lower and macrophages are a key element. And, you know, going into like basically seeking out foreign invaders to destroy them, get them out of your body. And so she helped me with um, some stuff that I could do to increase the macrophages in Sebastian's body, as well as some other things that could help detox him of the mold. And she was a huge key player in helping turn Sebastian's health around. So you are seeing all of these symptoms and what I'm hearing is a lot of the symptoms that were shoved over into the autism category actually also are in line with somebody that has been exposed to mycotoxins. Oh yeah. I, I mean, just in this, again, this is why it was a blessing that I got so sick as I did, because had I not, then I may not have put two and two together. I mean, I couldn't retain information as an adult. When I was an avid reader, I couldn't read it. I couldn't read a page anymore without you know, not knowing what I just read, I, I'd have to go back and reread re it. Same for recipes. I could look at a recipe before mold and I know exactly what it said. I wouldn't really have to look at it ever again. But then I found myself, I have to keep looking at the recipe because I forget what, it, you know, the, the next step was. Um, I became kind of um, a hermit because I didn't want to be around anybody because I didn't feel good. Well, that was Sebastian. You know, his, his, preschool teacher would tell me that a normal day for Sebastian would, he would stand just kind of in the corner all day long. And if they went to recess or something, he had terrible time transitioning, he would scream. Um, it, it was, you know, he just, he didn't want to be around anybody. He wouldn't play with any, anybody. He had um, a hard time with uh, potty training, which a lot of kids that are um, exposed to mold have a hard time with potty training. He, um, I, actually pulled up some of the early signs of symptoms. Do you want me to just share my screen? Yeah, definitely, please. So we can just look at them. Let's see. Is this it? I thought I did. Give me a second. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Okay, here, okay. You see this? Yes, so. So, uh, <laughs> Ignoring the danger. Okay, well, when you don't feel good, I mean, think about if you have the flu, are you really aware of what's going on when you feel that crappy? I mean, you're, you're, you just aren't, you're more, you know? So yeah, he didn't, he ignored danger because he was just, he was zoned out pretty much all the time. He did reject cuddles, but that's because he didn't feel good, you know? like like me, myself, whenever I was going through mold, I didn't want anybody to touch me because um, I was so inflamed. I had terrible joint pain. I had static shocks going throughout my body and I didn't want anybody to touch me, especially my head because my head, it, it hurt to even touch it. 
um, noise and intolerance to sounds. Um, he, I also became intolerant to sounds as well while in the townhome. So any loud noises, depression, you know, anybody that doesn't feel good for a prolonged time starts to be depressed. I mean, I also suffered from depression in the townhome because I didn't feel good. I didn't want to be around anybody. Um, I felt like nobody could understand what was going on. And when he's a baby and he's so young, how do you think he's going to exhibit how he feels? It's going to shut down. It's going to shut down. Hysterics? Well, um, one of the top symptoms of mold is developing anxiety. And I had developed the same type of anxiety to where when I had an attack come on, nobody could, could, could console me. I've never had anxiety issues in my life. And I would find myself on the ground, just screaming and crying. That's what Sebastian was doing too. Tiptoeing. We just went over tiptoeing. I also had, um, you can see in my metal, medical records, they had to treat me also for inner ear fluid while in the townhome. I think they had to treat me for it twice because I had so much fluid in my ears while exposed to mold and then hyperactivity. So, um, you know, those are the early signs of autism and Sebastian had them all. And that was because of mold. And if somebody had evaluated me, I would have had all of these signs too. Um, I also have his... I also have his other stuff up, his evaluation. Or do you have any questions, Elizabeth? Over any well, of that? from here, I mean, from here, we were gonna just talk about you sought out help from him, right? You worked on detoxing him. And for people that know about autism, one of the main internal issues that happens is your body is not able to detox as well. Your gut is not balanced. It's not able to detox as well as most people's. So you went through the process of detoxing him. How long did it take for you to start to see a positive change in his behavior and in his body to the point where he is now, where this is not a huge issue for him? Six weeks out of the town home, my son started to love taking a bath again. Bath time in the town home became impossible. He would scream and scream and kick and punch. Um, and now I know it's because his head was inflamed and he didn't want me to touch his head. And um, just as I didn't want to take a shower and wash my hair because my head was so inflamed. Um, but when we got out of the town home about six weeks after, I noticed a big difference in Sebastian. He went back to wanting to be held and cuddled. He started smiling again. He actually wanted to go and play at the park and go down the slide and stuff where before he would just kind of walk around at the park and just, you know, maybe look at some things, but that was it. Um, so about six weeks after I started to see a change in him. That's incredible. That, I mean, that's quick. That's a quick time frame to start to see such a, like a stock difference there. That's incredible. And where is he at today? How is he doing today? And how far out are we from that time frame today? So we are about six years out from leaving the townhome. We were five years out when he was formally diagnosed with autism. And three years after his diagnosis, he was reevaluated and um, he is no longer considered autistic. And that's because we were able to detox him of all, all the mold and mycotoxins. Um, it was a process. It wasn't easy. It was a long, grueling process. I will tell you that. Um, but he was detoxed and thankfully he was able to heal. And so now today he is, um, yeah, <laughs> he's just the sweetest kid. He still has, um, problems with his language as in, um, okay. pronunciation. Careful. But other than that, he is, um, a regular kid who likes to talk back to me and, you know, try to get <laughs> his way and, <laughs> um, he's great. So is there anything else that you'd like to share for people that are hearing about this for the first time? They're hearing that autism and mold do have a connection. Is there anything else you'd like to share with people? You know, it, it was a hard pill to swallow. Um, just even 
thinking that mold could do anything that it did to our health. Um, because before we moved into the townhome, I didn't think mold was a big deal. And a lot of people still don't think mold is a big deal until they go through it. So I would just say this is that if you have a kiddo, um, because again, mold affects everybody differently. And we were lucky that our environment was so toxic to where it was easier for us to put it together because we were all struggling with issues. Most families, there's usually one or two. And a lot of times it's the kid, especially the younger one who's closer to the ground, you know, crawling around where all the mold spores and mycotoxins settle, take them and get them tested for mold exposure. Just do it. It could be mold exposure that's causing them to regress, that's causing them from um, being able to start to speak, um, that fatigue, night sweats, bedwetting. Bedwetting is a big sign and symptom in kiddos. Um, being exposed, dark circles. Have you had to get tubes for your kids? Why? Why are their ears, you know, having problems with fluid? There's a reason. And usually it's, it's, a, it's a reaction to something in their environment. So a lot of times, uh, and unfortunately, um, a lot of mold inspectors, they're not that good. Uh, they just do air samples, which leave people thinking that everything's okay when that air sample is the worst sample to do in the industry because usually it'll show that there's not a problem. The most critical part is actually do the, doing the full assessment of the home to identify if you have mold growth, where it's located, and then to what's causing it. Um, if you rely on an air sample, then usually that leaves people with a false sense of, of security that there's not an issue. So I would just say the best thing to do is go get your kid tested by a doctor for mold exposure. And you need to take them to a doctor who actually tests and treats for mold, which is more of a functional doctor. Like earlier, you mentioned Dr. Peter Osborne. He's a, he's a great functional doctor that can test you for mold. Um, he's a, he actually helps a lot of our clients and um, they have a lot of success with them. You can go call him, even Dr. Haley Eddington. She's in the Austin area. She's the one that helped me um, she is just a brilliant, you can also call her and, um, but if somebody is struggling with any issues in your home, even if it's just one person, it could be mold. Just, just go get them tested. If it's not mold, okay, it's not that, but it could be. And if it is, then you might have your answer, which means you have a really good chance of possibly getting all their issues and symptoms to go away. That's huge. That was, a long, so that was, a, that was a long answer. <laughs> That's all right. It was, it was a perfect answer. Thank you so much. I know this is not an easy topic at all, but it's so needed and people need to hear a personal story. So they're not just kind of searching in the dark thinking like this can't be my kid. Like I can't be the only one going through this. So we just thank you so much for sharing that and sharing Sebastian's story. For those of you listening, thank you so much for tuning into another episode of Toxic Mold Sucks Stories. Uh, Peter Osborne is an event sponsor for our pie in the face fundraiser, which is raising funds to first fill our toy replacement fund to help kids who have lost everything due to toxic mold go on shopping sprees. So if you'd like to purchase a pie that will be thrown in one of our many contested spaces, please check out our website and go to the pie in the face button. And we look forward to sharing another exciting episode with you next week.